Okay, we're going to do a kind of a combination of uh, um, PowerPoint, Anne's very rare sense of humor, <laughs> and Carolyn Twingley's uh, expertise, and show and tell, and guessing game. One little guessing game. So if you'll stick with us, we'll start with a couple of things. Doesn't Carolyn have a sense of humor, too? Hers isn't Irish. <laughs> but notice she wore green, too. You may notice that we have a new logo. Um, this was designed by Evan over there. Raise your hand, Evan. And, uh, yes. And Evan might be able to explain it better, but I'll try, and then you can tell me whether this is okay. Okay, the looking glass, or the magnifying glass, is over the B, because the Bismarck Historical Society is always searching and looking for history. That sound okay? The railroad tracks crossing with the river blue are the two real big things that brought people to Bismarck. The shield is because we're all tough. <laughs> I don't remember what the shield was. <laughs> it's a heraldry, correct. And so that's going to be our new logo. Um, we made the decision to try to make something totally ours, and Evan did a wonderful job on our new logo. So we'll see it on the next newsletter that comes out also. So thank you, Evan. Okay, I first wanted to share our mission statement because this tells all of why we're doing the program tonight. Our mission statement is, our mission is to learn, preserve, and promote the history of Bismarck. You know you want to keep your mission statements short and sweet, and that definitely is about as short and sweet as we could get it. So let's talk a little bit about what archive means, because it can be used as an English teacher here. It can be used as either a noun or a verb. So when you look at the word archive as a noun, it means the actual historical collection itself. It's your archive. And it can be uh, numerous items, as you'll be able to tell today when we go through kind of our show and tell what kinds of things can be donated and used in, t in an archive. As a verb, the word archive is the actual action of storing those items. You archive them. So an archive can be archived. I'm sorry, that was my English teacher coming out in me. <laughs> okay, next I would like to uh, invite Carolyn Twingley to tell you a little bit about how we go about doing the archiving, what um, kinds of experience she brings to the table, and uh, tell you a few other things about um, uh, what we're going to do tonight. So please welcome our main archivist, Carolyn Twingley. Thank you, Ann. Some of you might wonder, now, how did I become the archivist for the Bismarck Historical Society? Well, I think I was the only one that volunteered, <laughs> but very happy to do so. <clears throat> I don't have a formal degree in archives or public history like they talk, uh, call it now, but did establish the institutional archives at Bismarck State College <clears throat> while I worked in the BSC library. I had lots of ties to the college which included my father, my husband, and son, who were all teachers there at some time. My youngest son, my husband, and I all graduated from BSC. And at the time that I started the archives, I had worked at the college for over 20 years and had a good handle on their history, as well as a passion to see things saved. It all started in the basement of the library building. Under the stairs were old catalogs, some photographs, printed materials, were randomly stashed along with Christmas decorations and the ballot boxes. 
Today it is a dedicated space within the library and became very useful during their 75th uh, anniversary of the college. While at BSC, I took as many workshops as I could to learn about collecting. I learned that some archives limited their collections to photos and documents, while others collected objects as well. These are useful in creating displays to call attention to the mission of collecting for in, for in archives. The Bismarck Historical Society has been accepting objects, many shown in our display tonight, <clears throat> as well as the paper documents, books, photographs, etc. It is our policy to, to accept only Bismarck-related materials. Our state archives does a wonderful job of covering everything else, and we could never compete with them. Um, we also have a gift agreement patterned after other similar archives that state once something is given to the Bismarck Historical Society, it cannot be returned at a later time. So we make sh certain that families and individuals are aware of this. But if you have treasures under your basement steps or stashed with your Christmas ornaments and you think the Bismarck Historical Society might be interested, please keep us in mind. I grew up in Bismarck and have lived here my whole life, <coughs> adult life, yet I cannot believe how much I've learned about our community since joining the Bismarck Hist Historical Society. Two years ago, we published a little cookbook that focused on the people who came to Bismarck in the early days, Lebanese, Jewish, Germans from Russia, Norwegians, Swedes, African Americans, and Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we tried to tell a little of their stories and also included as many recipes and pictures that we were able to find. Beyond the different nationalities, we also included information on the cannery and victory gardens in, the, in Bismarck that came about during World War II. <clears throat> we have sold over 300 cookbooks and they have more available if you're interested. Beginning in 1945, the cannery was sponsored by the Agricultural Department of Bismarck High School with Roy Neff in charge. I don't know if you remember the uh, long, kind of ugly green building just on the other side of the municipal ball diamonds on, on South Washington. That was, that was the cannery. I always thought it was just storage for Parks and Rec, and maybe that is now, but um, that's how it started. Women, Women were encouraged to bring their produce and have it canned while food was sparse at times during the war. The first year, 25,000 pints were canned during the three-month period that the cannery was open. In 1946, 11,000 pints were produced, and in 47, 13,000 pints. Part of this work was done by Bismarck High and Century, not Century, St. Mary's High School students for the hot lunch program at the two high schools. Each year, the home economic classes from the local schools put in several hours at the center. It truly was a community project. Plots for the Victory Gardens show locations of the plots and who purchased them. Uh, <clears throat> and I believe that was closer down to the river so it could be um, irrigated and, and maintained that way. Another book that tells the story of Bismarck in the 1930s is Colorblind, the forgotten team that broke baseball's color line by Tom Dunkel. <laughs> Banna? <laughs> it's a great story of baseball, but in particular, Satchel Paige and the other black players that were not yet allowed to play in major leagues, but were talented enough to do so. Other Bismarck names, such as Neil Churchill, Mac McCarney, are mentioned, and the story is just another part of our Bismarck history. Bismarck has always held education of its youth in high regard. Um, we have scrapbooks displayed tonight um, that were put together by elementary school staff, I think Wachter. Uh, PTA was an important aspect of the elementary school education in Bismarck. In 1937, a group of concerned businessmen gathered to discuss the creation of a junior college to also serve the community. I think it was in 1930 or thereabouts that Congress had allowed for 
um, communities to have a, a two-year college. And while the first vote in 1937 did not pass, the second one in 1939 did, and Bismarck Junior College was created on the third floor of Bismarck High School. Even during that time of the Depression, these businessmen were able to raise $5,000 to establish this community college. At Bismarck High School during World War II, BJC students could enroll in aviation courses that included both classroom teaching as well as flight training in a small uh, Cessna aircraft. Many of those students became pilots during the war. Um, the college got teachers from the high school staff um, being in the same building and also I think called on engineering people at the state highway department to come and, and teach young people <clears throat> as well as, as these aeronautic pilots. I'm, I'm sure it was um, Mr. Watts and others at that time. After the war and the creation of the GI Bill, BJC outgrew the third floor of the high school. The building on Boulevard and Ninth was the first freestanding college, which also was quickly outgrown. Because of the generosity of Harold Schaefer, land was given on the current site of Bismarck State College, and it is now the third largest college in North Dakota following the two universities. Um, we've got a framed um, album of Skitch Henderson up with our collection. And you, if you had, did not see our September program, you're probably wondering what in the world is Skitch Henderson doing in our collection. Well, he served as the original band leader for The Tonight Show with founding host Steve Allen, as well as for Allen's Saturday Night Variety Show, then came back to tonight after the departure of host Jack Parr and his orchestra director, Jose Mellis. Henderson left tonight show again in 1966 during Johnny Carson's early years as host. In a word, he loved Bismarck. In his own words, a la YouTube, he says he got his professional start in Bismarck as well as his first real paying job. He worked for KFYR radio as a pianist and learned to operate the broadcast engineering apparatus that kept him employed between gigs at the piano. He didn't live here long. As an itinerant musician, he was on the road a lot, but returned often. In his later years, he and his wife would fly into Bismarck and drive down to Fort Yates for the powwows and just wander the streets of Bismarck greeting old friends such as the Myers, the Eckbergs, Susan Lundberg, and Bell Mayhus, etc. This I learned from Walt, Walt Bailey, who in my mind is the keeper of the stories. And there are times I'd just like to say, Walt, tell me another story. <laughs> Once again, we would like to encourage you to think about any treasures relating to Bismarck that you may want to donate. And how, are, how do we archive things? An example would be a postcard collection we, sh we received from our past board member, Ted Quanrude. It's, uh, we've got the photo album over there with the um, postcards. And I, if you've done scrapbooking or anything of that kind, you know that those Photo albums are not the healthiest place to put photos or postcards or anything for preservation. So um, we put them in sleeves. We have sleeves like this that we put our photos in, our postcards in. Um, and these come in all sizes. We have large enough ones for posters, for special editions of the Bismarck Tribune. Um, and those are things that we order through archive catalogs. I don't believe there's anything like this available in Bismarck, but um, that is part of, the, part of our process. Um, they, <clears throat> so we will be getting those out of that photo album shortly so the cards are not ruined. There are boxes of varying sizes that hold collections of, of uh, many different things. Um, Little boxes for buttons, other small items, file boxes that we will put proper um, files into the box, large 
ones for larger collections. So slowly we are purchasing them. They're, they're not real cheap, but <laughs> it's what we need to do for the long term to save these things. Um, and what is coming up for us? Well, we have a new project that's, that we're excited about, but it, it is going to be big. Um, the Bismarck Historical Society has taken on the job of transferring 72 volumes of police logs beginning in 1917. <laughs> Prior to that date, volumes were lost to flooding. The first 25 volumes need to be retyped as they are fading away fast. And I think these are pretty good sized books. <clears throat> All the years then will be scanned and digitized for for preservation. The police department is thrilled that we are taking on this big project and we have the full support of the chief of police. So we have our work cut out for us and will keep us bu busy long into the future. And um, so that's, that's what we've been starting with. And we've got a few things that we've brought and a few things that we've taken pictures of that Ann will show you. Give everybody give her all. Uh, the part about getting involved with helping us transcribe the police records uh, is in the new upcoming newsletter. And uh, you can get a hold of uh, Marilyn Schneider in order to uh, be a part of helping with that. So just be aware of that. Okay, this is our new headquarters. We kind of call it headquarters. Basically, um, we needed a little bit more accessible storage area than what we had going through kind of a rabbit warren to get to our things and get them in and out. And it ended up that whenever we had something, I ended up putting things in my garage and leaving them there for a long time because they just didn't want to go through the process. So we ended up getting a, a combination storage and what we call our conference room. So this new area is right uh, on 533 Airport Road, and it's a combined two-room area. So our storage room will go through some of the things that it, uh, is in that area. And then our conference room, we have a nice big conference table in there, so that we hold our board meetings and other meetings in there now. Um, so that answers your question. That's right now where we're storing things. It's safe. Um, it's a, uh, we've got things to store them in that are safe also. So, um, it, for example, one of the first things we bought when we got a storage area before was to get a fireproof uh, file cabinet. And believe me, to get it into that first storage area and out again, and the second one also was quite the deal. So that kind of shows you how the files are stored in there. Uh, by Carolyn's uh, beautiful filing system. And then we were lucky enough for Deb, Guy, I go to um, actually donate to us a second fireproof uh, cabinet, which we're putting to good use also. So those things, because they're fireproof up to a certain point, uh, certainly are where a lot of the paper items are going. We acquired, uh, because of Walt, um, we, we were able to acquire one of their display cases when they did their renovation from the, the uh, Heritage Center. And we're just sitting on it right now because we don't have a museum yet. That would be on the big bucket list in the sky. We have racks to hold some of our items to make them more accessible. We have a couple of cabinets to store all of our um, things in that, that Carolyn needs, uh, and also stationary items. And then we also have a couple of bookcases and a couple of other things to store things in. The rest are in boxes uh, that have not been archived yet. Here's a couple interesting ideas that will show you what that gray uh, box is used for. Um, this particular one sitting on the top of the bookcase in the storage has got all newspa newspapers in it. And then we had a real interesting item donated 
about a television show that was shown in 1963 called Red Sky Over Bismarck. It's on film film, you know, 16 millimeter film. So that, we get unusual items also that are donated to us. So now we're going to do a little bit of what we would call show and tell. And you will be able to browse these items up here on the stage. We'll get another table and put it down here and spread things out. If you will please carefully look through these items. Um, and uh, we're going to go through some of the things that have already been donated. Just give you an idea of things we've already gotten. So where is my, my Vanna? I think we, yeah, we're over there. Okay, we have several, several different kinds of what I call commemorative plates. And some of them were given to us by Ted Quandrude, but others um, I actually got um, I actually got uh, some at the um, antique place and donated them. So there's two original um, kind of metal plates of the original Capitol building. And I, those were from Ted's uh, collection. Then we have a beautiful plate that is listed as the Missouri River Bridge, which you might want to really take a good look at that. You too, it's, go it's a gorgeous plate that was uh, donated by Ted. What's that? <laughs> yes. And then uh, the next thing is a Bismarck uh, Centennial plate. Thank you, Vanna. And uh, a one from the First Presbyterian Church, and probably every church anywhere has had plates like this. So that's kind of an idea of what kind of commemorative plates that we have been had that were that had been donated. Okay, uh, books. We have every kind of book you could possibly imagine, starting with a 1925. Bismarck High School yearbook, Prairie Breezes, which is a pretty valuable. Um, I lost all my yearbooks from Bismarck High in a basement flood, never to be seen again. Okay, next is our book. Sorry, I put it over here. That I mentioned earlier, the colorblind book. And we have... Uh, I'm not sure how many boxes of this book that we're going to start um, giving out as gifts because the, all those boxes were donated to us by the Atkinson family who had bought quite a few of them. And then when Myron passed away, they made the decision to give them to us. And we thought giving them away at programs might be uh, a good way to kind of do that. We can do that tonight. Um, next is one called Badlands and Bronco Trails by Lewis F. Crawford. Don't know the date on that one. I guess I could have looked at that. Nineteen twenty-two. This is uh, dear to our hearts, with it being uh, Cleo Gannon. Ever and always, I shall love the land. And I think it's a book of poetry, right? Yes. <laughs> um, then there's one called uh, The Little Shadow Catcher by our own Tom Heskin. And then the book that a lot of us have on the history of Bismarck, you have to get it on the secondary market now if you're ever looking for this book. Um, and it took me a long time to actually track it down because I don't know what my mom did with, my, with ours. And then uh, the last uh, book that we have uh, is Miracle on the Missouri, the story of the Garrison Dam. So you see we do stretch the Bismarck thing a little, thing, little bit. If we get something that has been donated, we will take it for our archives. Who was Lewis Crawford? Don't know. Oh, okay. Do you know who Lewis Crawford was? 
He was superintendent. <laughs> I think you heard her. Thank, thank you, Marilyn. Yes. Uh, she was our she was our phone a friend. <laughs> okay. Next are some really important things to the history of Bismarck. And when we get these, I just about my jaw just about dropped. The first is is Ted's. Um, vintage um, postcard collection. I'll, and I'll be showing you some of these a little bit later. But uh, you'll have a chance to browse these if you're careful. Like I said, it's hard because it's a, it's a photo album. And they're kind of open at both ends. But um, it's a good collection. So we're very happy about that. About a year ago, um, or about a year before he passed away, he was actually going to do a program on his postcards, and then he got ill, so we had to cancel that. Okay, the next are really near and dear to my heart, because I taught at Walker Junior High School. These are the PTA scrapbooks from the Walker Elementary School. There are three of them that have wooden covers, one of which is a beautiful wood, beautiful color, um, cover that they took the wood burning and then they painted it in with color. And then they switched over to leather. So they did a leather kind of a scrapbook. And this was intended to have the PTA be a part of, of what was going on at the school. So now I'm going to share a little bit about Jeanette Myrie because I ran across a couple of good stories about her when I was doing the uh, Bismarck uh, history book that we did. But this is a favorite story of mine, being that I taught at Walker for so many years. The even when I was there, the whole South Side image was still there. You know, my mom cried when she found out I was getting a job there because she thought it was you know the tough side of town. I loved working at Walker. It was wonderful. I was there for 33 years, so I must have liked it. But anyway, Jeanette Myrie, who the school Jeanette Myrie is named for her, was the principal of uh, Walker Elementary School from 1924 to 1966. And I want to tell you a little story that just warms my heart. As you can tell from the picture, she was quite a proper lady, very much a proper lady. She was very, very upset by the attitude that people had about the South Side. And so she made it her job with particularly the PTA at Walker Elementary School that the parents understood that they were right up there and important. And so she would put on her beautiful little woman white gloves and she would bring her own her own silver service to serve the coffee for the PTA meetings because she wanted to have them know that they were just as important as anybody else in the city of Bismarck. So I just think that's a wonderful story and that it's well worth that she has a school named for her. Um, it's where the terrace is now. And they did add on to the, um, which would, would be the kind of the south west side when I was young. They added on a part that looked like Wilmore, kind of a section sideways to it. So, so what, what was the division, that area, that it would have had such a, a bad reputation? Anything south of the tracks, always. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the area that walkers have made millions on now because of the dam going in. <laughs> yeah, it's just the south side image. And you know, there, there are lots of things about the south side that people don't know. Like for example, every town that the railroad went through, the street south of the railroad tracks was called Front. Every one. So Front Street, probably in every town because it was on the south side of the tracks was probably the, the 
Great Northern, I mean the, the Burlington. Burlington, uh, no, uh, Northern Pacific. Pacific. Okay. okay, moving on. Okay, some miscellaneous items. Uh, you can move over here now. We have this cute, wonderful, oh, I can't move. <laughs> cute, wonderful little statue of the big boy. And uh, I just take a, just take a uh, show of hands between the two shakes who are purple cow people, <laughs> who are brown cow people, who are pizza burger flying style <laughs> and hot and tots. Do you know how bad those hot and tots are? You know how they're made? No, I mean, I just think it's very interesting. They take those little cinnamon dot candies and put them in the Coke, and that's how it gets a cinnamon flavor. Nothing too fancy. Okay, next is what uh, Carolyn was speaking about earlier, about we have a framed, which framing thing sometimes is the best way to go, a framed uh, um, a record album of Skitch Anderson to remind us, and that one actually uh, hangs in our headquarters. Okay, next is my dad's shoe shine kit. I had to uh, donate this because it's every time I think of my dad and working at Murphy Insurance, I remember Sunday afternoons, him getting out his uh, shoe shine kit. And one of the things that warmed my heart the most about that shoe shine kit was when my dad was kind of failing and my brother came to town, he took that shoe shine kit over and shined every one of dad's shoes for him. And he sat there and watched and was so delighted that he was getting his shoes back to being shined, which was very important to those men to get their, uh, what were those shoes called? No, the uh, wing tips, to get their wing tips uh, shined. Okay, uh, we wanted to remind you with the vintage telephone. Do you guys all remember party lines? So that would have been maybe one of the, the things that, uh, that kind of phone that you would have used. And that's Caroline's phone. We don't get it yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, and this is another item that uh, you don't get yet because it's my dad's. Um, phone book that went all the way up to Steele. So it was Bismarck, Mandan, and Steele telephone book. And why don't you read some of the numbers, if you can find any. I think my grandpa's grocery store was the address. I think it was 221, because they were 221 3rd Street, or 122. Was this remember. when there was still a shop that you had to call, so? Uh, no, I think it was just a three digit. And then it became, so then it became capital three, yeah. right. then CA3, then BL, which stood for Blackburn, BL5. And now they don't tell us the names for the other prefixes anymore, but that's kind of how they were by the, the letters that the numbers were. Okay, um, we have a couple of what I call closed butlers that men use. Now they're really, really fancy. It's got a place for their jewelry. It's got a place for their shoes and everything. But it's just a way for a man to be able to lay his suit out nicely for the next day of work. The reason we are keeping these and the reason we think that these are really valuable pieces of history is because hopefully in our future, when there is a museum, it will be a perfect way to uh, display a clothing item, yeah. such as maybe an um, army uniform or something like that. We just thought that would be a, a great way to do it without having to put it on a hanger or something. Okay, some of the art 
we could not bring because it's too big, but this one we did. This is um, that one. The, a wet plate photo that was uh, done by Shane Balkowitz of uh, Charles W. Murphy. And I'm sure that that one is also in his book that just came out that is just phenomenal, is what, is what uh, plate photography book. Okay, and then the rest of these, you'll just have to use your imagination. This one, again, a lot of these are hanging in our headquarters. This one is a beautiful uh, watercolor that was done by Rosemary Landsberger, big art person in Bismarck. And then our, our buddy, Cleo Gannon, this, this was done, Clell, I always say it wrong. He lived right up the street from me and I don't know how to say it. Okay, Clell Gannon. And uh, this was, when he was a young boy, he did this painting on a gunny sack. And we've framed that. Then there are three pen and ink drawings. These two, and then my favorite. And I'm gonna tell another little story. Clell and his family lived up the street from me on Mandan Street. And the, the Gannons, that um, little shed with the person on the hat, on the, on the uh, roof waving their hat and the two people climbing up the tree could be me. <laughs> The hoses in that particular part of Mandan Street were what we called double deep. From the Gannon house down to about the third house from Avenue D were all literally double deep because it was at one time going to be a, a, I don't know why, there was going to be an alley in there and they never put it in. So that shed was probably a garage at one time or a livery that was way on the back kind of overgrown part of their property. And we'd go and, I, and climb up on the roof and play like we did, like we were neighbor kids and just, so living in that neighborhood was just a wonderful experience. Okay, this one by Vern Erickson is a beautiful painting. And the one that we don't, that uh, kind of uh, um, Walt is keeping for us with safekeeping is our famous one. The Battle of Mullins Corner that was painted by him about uh, what happened on uh, Fourth Street and Bloody Fourth. We have a Peacock Alley painting that was done of what I think that was called the Ring, right? Was that what that area was when you came first came in? It's a print. Yeah, it's a print. And then a Carl Bodmer poster and the original poster for the little casino play that was done before we did it as an association. Okay, now we're gonna play a little guessing game. If you know this, shout it out. Who is this North Dakota politician? Langer. Say it loud. Langer. What's his first name? Bill. Bill Langer, correct. What language is the text? German. So I was at an event doing a program and somebody walked up and handed me a campaign card that looked like this. <laughs> and I went, oh, well that's really interesting and I have my ties still with friends of mine that taught foreign languages in the, in the schools. And I asked one of my friends, because I don't know enough German except to make, make it a mess of it, but she translated this for me. So here's what it said. This is his campaign poster telling you about him. William Langer, Republican candidate for state's attorney of Morton County. I have lived all my life in the United States and have always had a good, had a good and learned understanding of the law. I was born here and have always been proud of being able to speak our mother tongue, German. <laughs> so that was a campaign uh, little card that he handed out when he was running for Attorney General of Morton County, State's Attorney. Okay, our postcard collection, which you'll get to look at, I just picked out a few to kind of show you what they're like. And I was going to do a show and tell on this, but it's kind of too hard to do, but just let your memory 
This one is a picture of looking westward on Maine. And if I can get my little pointer to work, this is where the Patterson is right now. And the thing I've always loved about this is the little vendor going down the middle of the street. Who knows what he's vending or what he's selling, but that's looking west. You can see What is that? St. Yeah, St. Mary's. Did you know? No, that's not St. Mary's. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Say that again. No, tell me. So you can turn away. Oh, <laughs> good. Thank you. Okay, this next one is an interesting one about a Red Cross canteen during World War I that was at the NP station. And the sign says soldiers and sailors. And that's how we get them sometimes. If they have a chunk out of the corner, you just have to kind of deal with that. Because someone tore off the stamp? Uh, no, well, yeah, that could be. Yeah. It could be, yeah. Yeah, the other side. I didn't think to look at the other side, of course. Um, this one is the Roanoke Hotel and the Presbyterian Church. So if you think of where the Presbyterian Church originally was, the Roanoke Hotel was across the street where the little um, hotel is now. That little teeny hotel. That used to be a boarding house. Yes. In, uh, let's see, a hotel in 1908, and it was still there in 1904, and then it became St. Vincent's home in 1927. And it also was uh, uh, Bishop Worley's house for a while. What street is that on? It's on uh, Second Second Street. Yeah, Second Street and Thayer. And um, what was the last one you said? Uh, let's see. Nursing home? Yeah, St. Vincent. Yep. Uh, yep. There were a couple of other things. It was a private home. Yep. Then it was bought by the diocese for Bishop Worley. And I think there was something else before it became the... I'll, I'll look it up for you. I've got it. I got 1899 for the date. I think that's when it was put up. That sounds right. Okay. The Presbyterian Church was, instead of being where it is now, it was where the parking lot okay, is. Okay, so the same block. Yeah, same block. So is this looking east or looking east? From You're looking east and north, kind of. Okay. You know when it was burned out? It was. It, it, they're still building there. They still just there. kept renovating or rebuilding there. The Roanoke? Uh, yeah, that same location. Yeah, that, that, that building's gone, though. Yeah. But that particular property has always had something. Right. Yeah. Oh. And that hotel has been hotel several like different names. Mm -hmm. Now, this one is listed as St. Mary's Parochial School. So as you recall, this was on 9th Street. And uh, it boarded kids. And also the nuns lived there at, at that in those early days. And that, then by the time I was back in Bismarck, that building had been raised and the St. Mary's had been built a little bit further north of that. Right? Am I right, Walt? It wasn't it on the corner of 9th and then the St. The same, the same, um, Alexis took Yeah, it. yeah. So it was in three different locations, right, that elementary school, counting where it is now. Okay. Um, this one is... Uh, we. We should talked about BSC. This was the first breaking of ground for Bismarck Junior College when uh, Harold Schaefer gave the property. This is one of my favorite ones, and I don't know that anybody could have guessed this because very few people even really know this place existed. But the Tyler family, before they got into Newlands Western Shop and stuff, ran some little cabins that could be rented called the Tyler Cabins, and they were kind of down below the Memorial Bridge. And that's kind of before my time. I don't remember it, but my parents certainly did. It wasn't before your time. It wasn't? No. Okay. They were still there when I ran the trampoline center. Well, that's right, the trampoline center. I used to go there. It wasn't before my time. One of those is still a little cottage. Yeah. Just a restaurant. 
Yeah. They took the rest from there. And moved it. Okay. That's a little tidbit I didn't know. Thank you. Okay, and then my favorite picture. In the 1920s, the very top of, at that time, what was the top of the McKinsey Hotel, which we now know as a Patterson, was a very popular place for a, um, having get-togethers and parties. They called it a roof garden. In several pictures of the Patterson, you can see um, uh, they've taken it toward the Patterson, and you can see people standing up there. And I don't know if you remember this, but the Patterson used to have this big sign on it that said fireproof and all of that. Okay, so this, I love this picture. All right, Carolyn is gonna talk a little bit more about the um, gift agreement that she talked about, and we actually have someone tonight that is going to donate to us an item, and she is going to sign her gift agreement. So if you will welcome my friend, Shirley Olgerson, I asked her to do this as a favor to me. Do you want to say a little bit about it? Well, for those of you from Bismarck and especially from North Dakota, you'll know that the 164th Infantry Regiment in the North Dakota National Guard was kind of a big deal. It has its roots in the 1st North Dakota Infantry, served in the Spanish-American War, World War I, and um, of course, we're the first U.S. Army unit to offensively engage the enemy in World War II when they reinforced the Marines at Guadalcanal. Anne's dad was in the unit. So I'd like to donate a book to the uh, Bismarck Historical Society. It's got a book plate in it. It says, this book is donated in 2020 to the Bismarck Historical Society by the 164th Infantry Association and Anne Vadney in memory of First Lieutenant Harry Badney, Company A. Thank you very much. Okay, and we'll, we'll have her, we'll have Shirley sign her gift, uh, uh, gifting agreement. Pam. <laughs> I did not write that book, but I helped, I helped the author. Thank you. The author is, uh, Terry Shoptaw. The author is Terry Shoptaw. He will be in town at uh, Sensational Sundays at the Bismarck Heritage Center, I think on Sunday the 22nd, to sign his new book, um, Sons of the Wild Jackass, the NPL in, in North Dakota. So um, okay. he's an interesting guy. <laughs> so sign away, and let's thank her for her donation. Thank you very much. Okay, there are four Life magazines, three of them just regular copies, and then a 50-year anniversary um, thing of Life. Uh, she had quite a few newspaper articles or newspaper things too, but we brought two of them here. Uh, one was the Bismarck Mandan photo album, is what it was called, came out in 2001. And then another one, there was a big section that came out in the paper called the Bismarck Tribune and its Times, 125 years. You may remember that one. They were inserts. Yes, they were an insert. Okay, the next thing was the legacy of North Dakota country schools. So we have kind of a little menagerie of things. And then the, a North Dakota Centennial Blue Book. Some of you may have this. And then my favorite, because it doesn't have pages torn out of it, it's a Montgomery Ward's catalog from spring and summer 1971. A Lewis and Clark companion encyclopedic guide to the voyage of discovery. And I'm sure that kind of came out when we had all the Lewis and Clark things going on. And a leaflet that I couldn't find any date on at all, but has to do with the photos of Frank Fisk and uh, got some information on how he got his start here. And then uh, Bismarck 100, that was the little booklet that came out when Bismarck turned 100. And then North Dakota History Journal of the Northern Plains. And then three kind of cute little items. A button from Burley County, 100 year celebration. 
and a wooden nickel for the covered wagon, so I'm sorry you don't steal it because the covered wagon isn't even there anymore. But we wondered what Margine was. Yes, Margine, <laughs> why would she have that? <laughs> and then the last are two money clips from the Dakota National Bank 50 year. So you can tell whenever there are centennial or some sort of celebrations, you get things that come out that are certainly useful. Okay, and by the way, we got one of the beautiful uh, posters that was done by Gary Miller during the uh, centennial. And we're putting a plea out that if by chance you have either or both of the other two that are somewhere in your house just gathering dust, we would really love to have the full set. So keep us in mind if you happen to have them. And uh, the last thing uh, to wind up our program is, I, I don't know if I can lift this. Oh, I can. can you lift that? Can anybody tell me what you think is in this? Typewriter. Nope. Good guess. Sewing machine? Good nope. guess. Who said that? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it's an accordion. And for your pleasure, as we finish tonight, while, Marilyn, or while uh, Carolyn and I are spreading things out, our resident musician, Evan, is going to play Margine's accordion for you. Let's give him a little root. And then we'll kind of set up the stuff for you to look at later. Uh, we'll kind of spread it out a little. What? This microphone? Yep, or this one? I am not an accordion player. Oh, yeah, better than us. I, I, uh, it was in November that I learned we had this, and I thought, oh, that'd be cool. And then in December they said, you want to play it in March? And I thought, March is a long ways away. Yeah, that'd be all right. <laughs> and then two weeks ago I thought I should start practicing. <laughs> so... <laughs> Evan. Okay, we're going to just take a little break now if you want to get some coffee or something and we're going to set up a couple more tables so you can browse the items that we have in our archive. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Appreciate it.